In this episode, we're going to continue looking at various clauses of the Constitution that people had issues with. In the previous video, we looked at the General Welfare Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. In this one, we'll focus on the Commerce Clause and the Supremacy Clause, as well as the Bill of Rights. The Constitutional Clause whose faulty interpretation has caused more mischief than any other is arguably the Commerce Clause, found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. It grants Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. To understand the original intent of this clause, we need to define key terms. First, what did the framers of the Constitution mean by commerce when it speaks of the power of Congress to regulate commerce? It turns out that it is impossible to find a mention of commerce at the Constitutional Convention or in the Federalist Papers that clearly refers to anything other than mere trade or exchange. Thus, the term commerce used in the Constitution means only trade and exchange. The term commerce did not include the production of things that are subsequently or later exchanged in commerce, such as manufacturing and agriculture. It did not mean, as modern interpretations would have it, all gainful activity whatsoever. If commerce clearly referred to trade or exchange, what did among the states mean? According to scholarly consensus, the original meaning of this phrase involved commerce between one state and another, not commerce that occurs in one state and merely concerns or has effects upon others. Thomas Jefferson, repeating the intentions of the framers, explained that the power given to Congress by the Constitution does not extend to the internal regulation of the commerce of a state, but to its external commerce only. That is to say, its commerce with another state, or with foreign nations, or with the Indian tribes. Likewise, James Madison wrote that the phrase, among the several states, grew out of the abuses of the power by the importing states and taxing the non-importing state, and was intended as a negative and preventive provision against injustice among the states themselves, rather than as a power to be used for the positive purposes of the general government. Finally, the word regulate in the 18th century meant to make regular, that is, to cause to function in a regular and orderly manner, as opposed to the word's modern meaning that suggests micromanagement and control. The Commerce Clause was intended to grant Congress the power to keep states from raising protectionist barriers against interstate trade. During the times of the Articles of Confederation, states were taxing goods from other states. They were experiencing economic wars that threatened to become physical wars. Thus, the clause was meant to provide for a giant free trade zone throughout the United States, thereby making commerce regular, and to prevent the states from obstructing commerce by leveling discriminatory taxes and the like against the goods of other states. Federal abuse of the Commerce Clause is well demonstrated in several cases. We will look at two that clearly show the interpretation of the Commerce Clause has deviated from its intended purpose and is used to justify federal powers that the framers could scarcely have believed. Probably the best known example of this abuse is the case of Wicker v. Filburn. There the Supreme Court concluded that a farmer growing wheat on his own land for his own use was subject to regulation under the Commerce Clause. Why? Because if he hadn't consumed his own wheat, he might have purchased wheat in the open market. His abstention from purchasing wheat in the market affected interstate commerce and thus made him subject to federal regulation. This case made perfectly clear that the Commerce Clause would no longer restrain the federal government in any serious way. Anything that might affect interstate commerce in some way had now become subject to federal regulation. Another case highlighting the abuse of the Commerce Clause is Gonzalez versus Raich or Reich, in 2005. In this case, the federal government challenged a California law that legalized marijuana for medical use. The federal government argued that medical marijuana was subject to federal regulation because its use affected interstate commerce, in particular the interstate marijuana market, a market the same government made illegal, by the way. The court agreed. Justice Clarence Thomas's dissent, however, clearly highlighted the dangers of this understanding of the Commerce Clause he noted that the two patients around whom the case revolved had used, quote, 
marijuana that has never been bought or sold, that has never crossed state lines, and that has had no demonstrable effect on the national market for marijuana. If Congress can regulate this under the Commerce Clause, then it can regulate virtually anything, and the federal government is no longer one of limited and enumerated powers. By holding that Congress may regulate activity that is neither interstate nor commerce under the Interstate Commerce Clause, the Court abandons any attempt to enforce the Constitution's limits on federal power." End quote. The logic of Justice Thomas's argument is inescapable. If the broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause is correct, then no aspect of American life is exempt from government oversight. Next, we look at the Supremacy Clause, which says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. It is often argued that when local or state laws contradict federal laws, federal laws, because of the supremacy clause of the Constitution found in Article 6, Clause 2, overrule the local and state laws. This is true, according to the supremacy clause, only when the laws created by Congress are constitutional, are made in pursuance of the Constitution, meaning federal laws that contradict the Constitution do not overrule local and state laws. Finally, the Bill of Rights. Why were the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, added to the Constitution? Those concerned that the new Constitution may be interpreted in a way that would contradict its intended purpose and gradually centralize more and more power into its hands at the expense of state sovereignty and individual liberty insisted for their support a Bill of Rights be added to further protect state sovereignty and people's natural rights from this new federal government. Upon this request or demand, some argued it wasn't necessary. A Bill of Rights was not necessary because the powers that states delegated in the Constitution to this new government did not include the authority to infringe on any of the rights proposed and eventually listed in the Bill of Rights. In case advocates of a stronger central government found ways to manipulate the meaning of the words of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights was seen as added protection, a just-in-case. Any student of U.S. history certainly recognizes that the addition of a Bill of Rights turned out to be a vital obstacle in slowing down the expanding powers of the federal government, and after the addition of the 14th Amendment and the fabrication of the incorporation doctrine, the states themselves. Initially, and one could argue constitutionally, the Bill of Rights only applies to the federal government, not the state governments. States had their own constitutions, and many, if not all at the time, had their own Bill of Rights. The Federal Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, do not apply to states or even private businesses, only the federal government. Speaking not from a principled perspective, but from a purely constitutional one, if a state wants to limit religious freedom, speech, or ban guns, well, as long as it doesn't violate their own state constitution, it can. It may not be good policy, but it is, from an originalist perspective, constitutional. To conclude, the Constitution was sold to Americans as a device that would keep government restrained. The General Welfare Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, and the Commerce Clause, Americans were promised, did not expand federal powers beyond those enumerated in the Constitution. Now Americans are essentially being told that these clauses mean what the Supreme Court says they mean, even if these new interpretations are completely at odds with the clear statements of the framers, and even if they lead to infringements on American liberties that no state voting to ratify the Constitution could possibly have imagined. This should lead one to ask, what happened? Clearly today, states are seen as inferior and subject to the federal government, not as independent states sovereign over all internal matters. The federal system of multiple jurisdictions seems to have morphed into a national system. Why? The video Federalism Morphs into Nationalism helps to explain this. Hope you watch.